use. They demonstrated that they have triumphed over what he calls noble values. And isn't, all, isn't that all that matters? Shouldn't Nietzsche only be concerned with which one has survived and demonstrated itself to be more powerful? The moral values or the noble values? So this is an important challenge. I mean, Nietzsche himself is saying that the moral values have been triumphant. And the challenge now is, isn't that all that matters? And Nietzsche's answer is no. So um, he's, Nietzsche is interested in making a genuine evaluation of these values. It's not supposed to be simply, and it's not supposed to be simply an impartial or neutral description of history. He's interested in getting clear about what they are, what these values are, what they stand for, what's happened, how they've tried. And he's interested in making an evaluation of that. And notice again, at the same time, the free spirit, the one who is honest, uh, asks, which of us would be a free spirit if the church did not exist? So Nietzsche is well aware, as I've been emphasizing, that it's through moral values, it's through the slave revolt and morality, that we become psychologically deep. In this case, it's through the triumph of moral values that, uh, he says, we become free spirits. I'll, I'll, I'll gloss that by saying, it's through the triumph of moral values that honesty becomes a high virtue. Okay. Questions about that? Questions about anything so far? Okay, so now we gotta talk a little bit more about the creation of these moral values. Um, what is that? Is it it is attractive to this performance. To the performance yeah. Actually, I love you said your been reading me, so it's like something about how this revolt happened through the Jews, but it didn't necessarily have to happen through the Jewish church in any model. Like, who sees the Jewifying as like a, just another word for the whole mob mentality, kind of? Um, so, mob mentality in the sense of valuing what is ordinary and plain. Yeah. Okay. Right. So, um, right. So, in our history, it, uh, the triumph of these uh, uh, self-denying, self-denying values have come through ancient Jews and in the more modern period, Christianity. Right. Revolt and morality. So this is the um, beginning of the triumph of the moral system of values. He says it begins when resentment itself becomes creative and gives birth to values. It gives birth to values. That is to moral values. He's going to say um, the resentment of beings denied the true reaction that of the deed, who overcome, so these are like weak individuals who are not able to act out in a physical, powerful way, not able to act through deeds, who recover their losses only through an imaginary revenge. Okay, so uh, this idea of resentment, um, the word, so Nietzsche's word is resentment, um, and that's in, um, he leaves it, he, so it's written in French, and so our translator wrote in German, so our translator leaves it in French. 
I'll use the word resentment. Um, but it's important to remember that this is um, well, let's see, it's a kind of imaginary revenge. So resentment, first of all, is a reactive attitude, a reactive emotion. So when something is, so when some external state of affairs is frustrating or painful or unpleasant, and it's something that we can't do anything about. So we are weak or impotent with respect to the source of that discomfort. Um, so everybody experiences this. Part of the human condition is to um, be unable to change certain things that are unpleasant or painful to us. This is true of even the most powerful people, even the nobles, as we'll see below. But the difference, uh, the difference is whether this feeling of frustration is allowed to fester and grow and come to dominate one's uh, existence, whether it comes to dominate one's complete outlook on life. When it does, Nietzsche thinks, um, so, sorry, so this is, resentment is a response to some painful event that we're unable to change, so there's a kind of powerless frustration, and when it's allowed to, when that feeling is allowed to fester, what we tend to do is search for an explanation for why we're suffering through scapegoating. Um, so what this psychological process does is when we suffer, and are unable to change that suffering, and this frustration comes to dominate our thinking, we search for some kind of explanation for why, why me? And what we look for then, in particular, is a moral failing. The fact that somebody did something wrong is the explanation for why I'm suffering. So this is the idea of scapegoating, that there's someone who has sinned, someone who has um, acted immorally as the explanation for why one is suffering, why something has gone wrong. Um, so there's a search for a moral failure to explain that suffering. Sorry, this is all what was that So there's a search for a moral failure to explain that suffering. And very often, not always as I'm about to say, but very often, the sinner, the one whose moral failing explain more suffering is, is you yourself. So it's you, your, it's often your sins, your immorality that is the uh, search for explanation for why you're suffering. So you deserve the punishment that you get, that the world is giving you, because of your sin. Often it's in oneself. This is going to be a very important mechanism. But not only. Another, uh, another common group to be scapegoated is to, identif to be identified as the source of one's suffering. Jews. And so anti-Semitism on Nietzsche's analysis is exactly a kind of scapegoating that's an expression of resentment. Okay, 
so remember, we're talking about this um, inversion of values from life affirming in the uh, noble values to life denying and asceticism in the moral values. And this is what comes about, he says, when resentment becomes creative. When people who are weak in terms of the ability to act out in the world compensate through imaginary revenge. Um, so resentment is the blaming others for uh, their moral sin, their moral violation, for the suffering that um, is inevitable. So let me report, I, I um, right, so, sorry, so, um, like I said, I'm going to stick with the English resentment. Um, just keep in mind that for um, Nietzsche, there's a tight association with the idea of revenge, imaginary revenge, um, and a tight connection to um, moral failures. Okay, so let me report. I, um, I feel a little bit bad that uh, when I first started talking about Nietzsche, I quoted somebody who was saying, oh, it doesn't matter, we can read them in any order, or whatever passages we want, doesn't really hang together, whatever. And I said, like, everything is wrong about that passage. Um, so I actually want to read a quote from the same guy that I think is right. Um, so this is Arthur Danto. And he says, talking about resentment, he says, sufferers tend to moralize suffering by holding someone or something responsible for it. Somebody's to blame. He says, why me, Lord, is the spontaneous response to being stricken. What did I do to deserve this? As though there were no unearned suffering, as it were. As though suffering were, in every instance, a sentence of some sort. In fact, Suffering is just the way the world is. And there's not a sin, there's not a moral violation to explain every instance of it. And he goes on, he says, if there's any single moral or metaphysical teaching that I would ascribe to Nietzsche, it's, it would be this. Suffering really is meaningless. There's no point to it. And the amount of suffering caused by giving it meaning chills the blood to contact. Okay, so the idea is that um, resentment involves the moralization of suffering. The idea is that resentment uh, involves some kind of scapegoating, and this is something that, as, um, as Danto suggests, this is something that Nietzsche is unequivocally opposed to. That this is essentially falsifying the world in a way that um, really makes it um, much, much worse, it gives rise to much more needless suffering. Um, so let me give one more example of resentment. I just alluded to this a moment ago. I want to jump ahead to um, page 48. So this is um, the second essay, section 11, where he says, that this plant, namely resentment, he says, blooms most beautifully among anarchists and anti-Semites. In secret, incidentally, as it always has bloomed like a violet, albeit with a different scent. So the thought is that anti-Semitic scapegoating um, is maybe the best contemporary example of seeking to explain some kind of suffering or some kind of social ill in terms of the moral degeneracy of somebody. The fact that somebody else uh, is doing something bad brings a punishment on the rest of us. Right? And that's his explanation of what's going on in anti-Semitism. OK, so, so to go back to section 10, um, this 
tendency to explain suffering by moralizing about it, by, by finding some moral failure that's supposed to explain it. This is what generates the slave revolt in morality.